Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Shane, Paul Boyer, Brad, and Mike Beatty. On this episode of DTNS, we walk through CrowdStrike's explanation of how a 40 kilobyte file ended up taking down eight and a half million Windows machines, plus a generative model that can give you eight new camera angles on an existing video, and gamers say union yes. Look for the gamer label. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 24th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom 24. Merit. <laughs> and from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And on uh, Utah's anniversary, uh, the 24th of July, I'm Scott Johnson. Oh, is it Utah? How old is Utah? Pioneer sorry, Day. So I don't know how many years it is, but Pioneer Day was, I guess it was more the day the pioneers arrived and went, Let's, we're setting up camp. And uh, now yeah. we celebrate it with more fireworks and a giant parade. So wish awesome. me luck. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, I'm the, the producer, Roger. No, yeah, hi, Roger. That's Roger Chang, yeah. the producer. Yeah. Don't mind me. Uh, <laughs> big fan of Pioneer Day, Roger. A lot of people don't realize. Yeah. Yes, I love the chicken. I love the chicken. Good. Yeah. This was a happy, smooth opening. Happy Pioneer Day, everyone. <laughs> hey, did you know Apple Maps is on the web now? No. Yeah. I, I thought it already... No, oh, no it was I, only I available I, in the it's app. The Mac, it's the Mac app. Yeah, I there's use. a Mac app. Huh. There's the iOS app. It's now available for anybody. You could just be on an Android phone and go to beta.maps.apple.com. It's a beta, but yeah, right. it's there. That's Look at cool. that. Look at Apple going all webby. Nice. Let's talk about the quick hits now. Alphabet generated nearly $85 billion in its Q2 earnings report, which is up 14% year on year and tops its own record Q1 earnings. Congratulations, Alphabet. With Google's search business continuing to grow, not surprisingly, search brought in $48.5 billion. Google Cloud made 10.3 three five billion dollars and Google's ad business racked up sixty one point six six billion dollars with eight point oh nine billion of that coming from YouTube ads alone. In its earnings call, Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat said that the company will invest an additional $5 billion into its self-driving car unit, Waymo. Waymo is part of Alphabet's other bets unit. Despite the unit losing $1.13 billion overall, that widens losses from $813 million a year ago. So... Alphabet did good. They did good. They did yeah. good. Yeah. Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo says his sources indicate Samsung's going to do good, too, is expected to ship its image sensors to Apple for iPhone use by as early as 2026. And that would be the end of an era. Tim Cook in 2022 said that they'd been using Sony sensors for more than 10 years. Quo's sources suggest that Samsung would send a 48-megapixel ultra-wide CMOS image sensor that would replace the iPhone 15 Pro's 12-megapixel ultra-wide. That's a nice upgrade. Uh, and The Verge's Wes Davis pointed out it would also improve spatial videos shot for the Apple Vision Pro. Ireland's Central Statistics Office says data centers used around 21% of the country's electricity in 2023. That's up 20% on the year before. By comparison, homes used 28%, though you'll see the number for urban homes quoted more often as 18%. Wind power made up 34.6% of Ireland's electricity last year, while solar contributed to 1.2%. Most of the rest came from natural gas. Got to get that wind power up. I don't think you're going to get solar up a lot in Ireland, though. But maybe the wind power could go up. Uh, Google oh, is you know, there's so many sunny days. Oh <laughs> there's those two or three sunny days where they could just, you know, crank it out. Exactly. Store it up. Uh, Google is offering some feature updates in the Google Play Store on Android. Categorized collections can highlight content from apps you've already installed, making it easier to find them. You can choose to exclude apps from being used to make recommendations as well. If you're like, you know what, I have this app, but I don't need anyone else knowing it. Uh, you can set that in personalization in play. That's an option from the main menu. Play games for PC users. There's not that many of you out there, but those of you who do it, can be excited to play multiple titles at the same time now. You can have multiple games in multiple windows. And in Japan, the Play Store is getting a new curated space for comics. 
An issue with Microsoft's July 9th Patch Tuesday update is causing a handful of Windows 11, Windows 10, and Windows Server versions to show the BitLocker recru- recovery screen when booting up. The company says the issue is even more likely if you have device encryption enabled. If you provide the recovery key from your Microsoft account when prompted, you should be able to start up your PC normally. If for some reason you don't have that key and need to find it, you can retrieve it from Microsoft's recovery screen portal before a permanent fix is eventually deployed. Okay, take a deep breath, everybody. CrowdStrike released its preliminary post-incident review, its PIR, on the Falcon sensor bug that caused so many Windows machines to go into recovery mode. The short version, it had a long history that said changing 40 kilobytes of configuration data didn't cause problems if you just ran a validation tool against them. That validation tool failed to catch the error on July 19th, and we all kind of know what happened then. So let's walk through the explanation. Falcon Sensor is the kernel-level software that failed. Falcon Sensor attempts to detect suspicious behavior on devices. So it's looking for patterns. It regularly adds tools for detecting new kinds of patterns from malicious software. So this is kind of like updating virus definitions, except instead of a file, it's looking for, well, if it does this kind of communication and uses this kind of process and does it this way, then maybe it's malicious. It can refine those tools with small bits of configuration data over time without having to reinstall the tool. Now, that's essential for security as they learn more about the malicious software. Oh, it does this three times, not two. Update the configuration file. New pattern detection tools are called IPC template types. Those come as software updates. As CrowdStrike learns those little things about the patterns it's trying to detect, it updates the configuration data. They call that program rapid response content, and it does not require a full update to the software. Those are template instances. Those are tiny. They're just little tweaks. When CrowdStrike pushes a new IPC template type, the new tool, it does automated stress tests, it does resource utilization tests, it does system performance impact, event volume, adverse system interactions, the kind of thing that would catch a recovery mode problem. The template instances, the ones that are part of that rapid response content, are tiny. The one that caused the problem on July 19th was 40 kilobytes. When it issues a template instance, it doesn't go through all of those stress tests. It assumes that most of those would be caught with the template type because they're updating such a small amount. Uh, What they do instead is use a validation tool, a content validator that looks for errors in the template instance. In February, CrowdStrike pushed a new IPC template type that would detect malicious software using a C++ feature called named pipes. Named pipes is a totally legitimate feature, but some command and control malware software uses it in a particular way. So they introduced the template type to look for this weird pattern of using named pipes. The template instance checked out fine, caused no problems. As it learned more about these template uh, named pipes patterns, it started sending updates. That's perfectly normal. It does it thousands of times a year. New template instances passed the content validator and were pushed out on March 5th, April 8th, and April 24th with no problems for Windows users. However, there are reported problems for a couple of Linux users, Debian in particular. They didn't do anything in response to that other than push a fix. Two template instances were pushed on July 19th. Both of them passed the content validator. One of them should not have and caused the problem with Windows. CrowdStrike said, if the content validation had not been automated, the problem would have been caught. So it was a bug in the automated validation that missed a configuration error that a human looking at it might have caught. I'm guessing it's not as simple as saying don't, Let's make sure we manually do that from now on. Take away the automated part of that particular process. Yeah, I mean, they are going to do that. That is one (laughs) of the many, many things they are going to do. Uh, uh, In fact, they will use local developer testing for all rapid response content instead of just automated validation. They'll also do rollback testing 
on the little tiny updates to make sure the updates are easy to undo. They'll do stress testing, fuzzing, fault injection, stability testing, content interface testing, all with the instances, even those little tiny instance updates, not just the template types. It will continue to use the automated content validator, but it will add more validation checks. And once it passes all of these tests, it will change deployment. So new types and instances both will get staggered deployment. You'll get a small canary deployment that makes sure it goes well before you gradually expand it, along with improved monitoring of how it's going. And customers will get to choose when and where updates are deployed, and content updates will come with release notes. Falcon Sensor itself is going to get better error handling, so even if something makes it past all of that, it should try to catch it from causing problems. CrowdStrike is also going to publish its full detailed root cause analysis in the future. If you want to know exactly how that 40 kilobyte file caused the problem, uh, that's coming as well. Mm. Man, uh, just goes to show you a tiny little file can do so much damage. Yeah, can you yeah. imagine 40K? That's like the size of the original Pac-Man code or something. It's brought Ridiculous. down the globe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, CrowdStrike published this because it finally realized what was going on. It's not like it was hiding the information. I don't no, think no, the company it knew what was going on. It wanted on. to get all its I's dotted and T's crossed. Yeah, and yeah. And I know that doesn't help uh, folks who were affected and continue to be affected um, and uh, yeah, had their lives disrupted uh, at, you know, or jobs or both. But I appreciate the fact that this is an extremely detailed explanation of what happened. Uh, I was reading through the, um, the, all the deets this morning, and it was just sort of like, man, all right, well, they're really telling us exactly how it works behind the scenes. So I appreciate that. Uh, mm. it, it, uh, it, it seems like the company's like, listen, here, here's this tiny little thing that just happened to fall through the cracks. We know it now. We don't expect it to happen again. And here's what we're going to do to mitigate uh, issues going forward. I think that's all CrowdStrike can do at this point. I mean, unless it's facing lawsuits. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, all I uh, I was going to say something similar about what I don't know what else we can expect at this stage from them to do. And I think what they've laid out makes perfect sense to me. There will always be people saying, well, why wasn't this implemented before? This seems obvious now. But so does everything in retrospect. It's all 2020. So I... I don't know. I've heard some people I follow in, in sort of tech uh, outside of Tom, and they're not nearly, let me put it this way, they're not nearly as careful as Tom is about saying things at the right or wrong time. And I like that about Tom. Some people don't do that so much. And they're making claims like, well, this is the end of them. They're just going to get replaced. This whole thing is going to get washed, and they're going to somebody else is going to come in and, and, and do it in their place. Yeah, and just I, like the Samsung Galaxy Note. Exactly. Uh, ruined I'm not, Samsung. Exactly. I'm not so sure that that is true at all because these things do happen. We live in a time where you know the echo chamber is so crazy the minute something crazy happens um, that none of us should be surprised by, I guess, the outcry and the freak out. But like all things like this, this will get tightened up and cleaned up and it'll yep. no no one will be talking about crowd strike in a couple of years. And guess what? Nobody that I know knew who they were before this. So, you know, I guess now we have some brand recognition that they didn't have to pay for. It's all free. I mean, I I had heard <laughs> of CrowdStrike, but I, I did not had. know the 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 minutia of <laughs> what goes on behind the scenes and what doesn't go well sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, honestly, it it is really easy uh, and certainly understandable to rip them apart, especially if you have had to rip apart your entire network fixing this uh, for not taking all of these precautions before. Uh, I get that. Uh, it is all more difficult to remember that if you were the person implementing these policies, you might have made some of the same decisions. They th did thousands of these updates and the content validation tool worked every time. Why would you delay security updates? You're risking the security of your clients if you don't get them these updates faster. Why would you delay them if you don't think there's a reason? Uh, there are a couple of these that I look at and I'm like, Phased deployment, I think, would be fine, even though you're doing security updates. I get that time matters, but you can do it. You can do it over a couple of hours, right? And it still would help you catch these kinds of bugs. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. I, I think, you know, some of the uh, some of the validation stuff is overdoing it now, but they definitely don't want this uh, to happen again. Uh, and some of it probably should have been done in the past, especially if they saw the problem with Linux. Those are the two things. They should have been doing phase deployment anyway. And 
when they had the problem with Debian in April, they should have jumped on it then and go, wait a minute, what's wrong with our content validation tool? Maybe they did. And maybe they were just dragging their heels on it. I don't know. Well, back in March, Stability AI announced Stable Video 3D, which could generate short 3D videos from an image or a text prompt. We talked about it at the time. Four months later, the company has unveiled Stable Video 4D, which can take a video input and then generate up to eight new videos from that initial single video not unlike a bunch of different camera angles. It doesn't actually fill in missing parts of the video, which some other models might do. It generates the new perspectives from, from scratch by only using that one original video as the prompt. Right now it can process five frame videos with a plain background across the eight views in about 40 seconds, uh, with the entire optimization, the 40 optimization, taking somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes. Uh, Stable Video 4D is available for research evaluation from Hugging Face with plans, the company says, for longer videos and more complexity. Hmm. It's interesting, right? Like uh, <laughs> you're, you, you say you that it's not using, Scott. well, you're not using generative fill, but my brain goes, and I read through this, my brain still says, well, you're still making stuff up. The process is just You are still though. making stuff up, yeah. but it's it's generating it from the ground up, which theoretically is harder to do, but also mm -hmm. could have better effects than trying to stitch in fill with the existing video. You right. So if you've, yeah. got, if, you've got a, if you've got a horse out in a field and you've got one angle on it, and now you've got two angles on it, three and eventually four, you're going to have to generate every part of that field that you can't see if it was real. In other words, if I just had my, I'm standing there looking at it, I don't have, and my head won't move. <laughs> Let's just have that part of this story. Uh, I, I'm not seeing where the seams are. This will see all of that, make up the difference, and hopefully do it in a way that is, I suppose, convincing. I don't know. I am a little bit skeptical of how these will look. And the samples they've shown so far, eh, it's yeah. all right. It's, it's it very is, prototype. Yeah. It's very early days. Yeah, for anybody who's uh, familiar with 3D, which many of us are, 4D is width, height, depth, and time. Mm -hmm. So if it's a moving 3D object, you're seeing it from various camera angles, but also different timestamps because the object is going to move. If that horse starts running, the beginning and the when the horse stops running, you know, that's not the same timestamp. Yeah. It also starts these... one in one place and ends in another. Yeah. yeah. And that that is impressive. Uh, and this will get better. These these demos are very cartoony right now. They're short. Uh, and they, as you said, they take 20 to 25 minutes to make a couple of seconds. Uh, but yeah, presumably this, this will all get better and you can try it out cause it's from stability AI. So you can, you can go mess around with it. No commercial, uh, licenses yet. So don't go putting it in your blockbuster movie, but even if it's slow, it is the kind of thing that I could see editors at blockbuster movies wanting to use if it's smooth mm -hmm. enough, especially with background effects and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Gaming VR. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts yeah. of use cases for this when when it gets better. Yeah, VR in particular. I mean, I don't know when it becomes real time, right? That's the hard bit uh, to predict with these things. And I, you know, I was asking about time earlier because of that very reason. Like, how long is it going to take to render this sort of thing? That'll improve over time. But to come up with all of that data that do that doesn't currently exist and do it quickly is going to be a challenge. And I still think twenty five minutes is impressive. But it's got to get better than that if we're going to see any kind of real time, you know. If you're going to use it on your phone, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you're going to, yeah. if you're going to use it, if it's in a an major motion bay, picture, maybe. you probably yeah. have some time. Yeah. Or even a game yeah. studio, right? You know, those yeah. kinds of things. It's it, it would be more for the uh, for the enterprise at that yeah. point. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, excited. it's nifty. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, CR poll said, is this real AI? And my answer is no, nothing is <laughs> really, I, uh, do it. It's a, a well-used misnomer to call these artificial intelligence, but it's an impressive generative model, right? It's also, it, it's also an interesting distinction to say generative fill versus generative content or whatever mm -hmm. our new term is going to be, because it's not the same. People may think of it as the same. It's like, well, you're just making stuff up. How's that different? Well, the process is different, and it's also this building it from nothing is important, an important distinction. Yeah. Whereas generative fill, say in Photoshop, I'm taking half an image of a, of a scene or whatever, and I'm telling it to fill in the other half based on what it knows of this. 
And I guess that's kind of happening here, but it's a little bit different. I think our under our vernacular around AI is is changing as yeah. swiftly as the stuff itself. Well, that's, where, that's what Sarah that's was a saying really good about point. Yeah, yeah. What, what you were saying, Sarah, about time is what's important here. Is it's it's not just oh we can see uh, more of the flag. We can see the flag waving in a way it didn't wave at all in the original, right? Because we're adding, we can add time to it. So time. it's it's mm -hmm. not just the next step after tweening. It's it's much more than that, right? Well, folks, if you have feedback about anything brought up on the show, uh, you can get in touch with us on social media. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of media out there where it's social, where you can talk to each other. I just made up that word. Uh, you can find us on X. <laughs> Apparently, it used to be called Twitter. Uh, that's <laughs> at DTNS show, at DTNS S-H-O-W. Uh, we're on Mastodon at mstdn.social, at Daily Tech News Show there. TikTok, we're DTNS Picks on Instagram and Threads. So it's at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, DTNS Pix, DTNS PIX on Instagram and threads. See you there. Last Friday, 241 game developers, that includes artists, engineers, programmers, and designers from Bethesda Game Studio, unionized under the Communications Workers of America, or CWA becoming the first Microsoft-owned game studio to be unionized. Employees have organized under CWA Local 2108 in Maryland and Local 6215 in Texas. Microsoft has recognized the union. And Wednesday, more than 500 developers at Blizzard, who work on World of Warcraft, have voted to form their union, called the Game Makers Guild, with the support of the CWA as well. Scott, how big of a deal is this? How, do, well, how does it change things? I'll tell you what, it's funny, just... You know, this the, the Blizzard news kind of breaking. That just happened today, and it happened right before the show. Uh, and I was going to make a whole lot of color about how Blizzard will probably be the next one uh, <laughs> to get right. involved. <laughs> I guess I was right without having any information or knowledge. You're like uh, a wizard who can predict things. <laughs> but it, it makes sense to me for a couple of reasons. One, Microsoft had had said and, and indicated kind of out loud and in public months and months ago <clears throat> during their acquisition of Activision Blizzard that they were open to the idea of these studios unionizing and doing it in kind of a separate way, not like a big Microsoft dictated way, but everybody kind of doing their own thing. And then they would look at it and back it if it made sense. And they seem very open to it. Um, but big corporations say they're open to things all the time until they happen. So I was, I was skeptical. Um, but I think it's significant, first of all, starting with, with uh, the folks over at Bethesda, when you say wall to wall, for those that don't know what that means, that means everybody at the top brass and the C-suites all the way down to game testers and Q&A and the guy in the mailroom. Like it's everybody within that studio. And that's I don't a, know if the executives are actually included, but it, but I get what you're saying. Like right. it's not just the editors or the QA testers. Right, it's, right. It's all the jobs, right? Yeah, it may yeah. not be exact. That's a good point. The executives may probably just have their own deals and are forbidden for whatever reason. But anyway, without knowing those details, it's a big deal because the gaming industry has long needed unionization in a lot of opinions. Um, it is one of the most churning industries. People are coming in and getting spit right back out, often on the successful end of a launch. A, a really successful game can happen, and you'll still get laid off. There are other industries like this as well, but the gaming industry has is, is grown rapidly and is now at a place where it has to start asking some of these questions. I think this is good news for workers. I think it's great news for other potential studios like Obsidian, um, Take-Two, Interact, or not Take-Two, um, forgot the name of the one I was going to say. Anyway, a bunch of studios that Microsoft has purchased, we could see more of this happening under their watch and then hopefully bleeding over into other big publishers like Take-Two is another publisher. I would like to see some of those other big publishers with smaller studios be more uh, uh, willing to do this and talk to their employees this way and come up with deals and let them unionize. And I think probably if I had to predict the next place you'll see it, Outside of the Microsoft-owned studios is probably Ubisoft. There has been a long, long cry for a, a unionization that works across their studios across the globe. And that's one of the problems with those guys is they have very different laws they operate under in very distinct and different locations and regions. And as a result, it's a little muddy. Um, but I think this is all good news uh, for you know, for especially for the designers. And, you know, what what will this do? This probably people are like, well, what are the knock-on effects? Some of them may look like less crunch. 
uh, something that has been you know talked about a ton in this business. How do we get people to uh, get better working conditions toward the end of the cycle of a product before it ships without wiping them out and burning them out? That's a big thing. Uh, fair pay, of course, is always a big thing. And um, just generally speaking, the, the workers having a voice in this otherwise very controlled industry. And um, I personally am all for it. I think this is great and will address a lot of those issues. Um, it would be nice if this sticks in a way that doesn't still make it so Microsoft down the road says, well, we're just, we still have to do layoffs with or without these unions. Like, I, I don't know where these decisions will, will come head to head where the unions and the corporate don't get along. But right now, Microsoft's playing nice, and I guess that's all you can ask for. Well, I'll tell you why Microsoft's playing nice, and this may not be as easy outside of Microsoft, is that an, in June of 2022, they agreed with the Communication Workers Association of America, the CWA, on a labor neutrality agreement. Mm. Uh, that meant they would take a neutral employ approach when employees covered by the agreement expressed interest in joining a union. Uh, those employees would be able to exercise their right to communicate and, and talk to union representatives about membership. Employees had access to technology supported and streamlined processes to join a union. Uh, employees could maintain confidentiality and privacy of their choice. And if a disagreement arised, there would be some arbitration. Microsoft agreed to that in order to convince regulatory agencies to let them buy Activision Blizzard because that agreement took place, uh, goes into effect 60 days after Microsoft acquisition closed. Uh, so it's been in ac activation for a while, but that's why you're seeing Microsoft be so nice because they agreed in order to get Activision Blizzard to be nice. Mm, that's a really good point. Hadn't thought about that. I mean, that's how these things go, right? But I say strike while the iron's hot. Get the organization. Well, don't strike happening. yet. You know. <laughs> well, not that kind of, not that kind of strike. But you know what I mean. Get in there. Start organizing. Start Lightly having your plan. Lightly tap that exactly. hot iron. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, corral that hot iron. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked to a friend of mine who's a union organizer, and he said he's seeing a lot of this. Like, you know, the fact that the labor market has been strong is giving a lot of workers confidence to form unions. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of momentum around the tech industry. So you're not wrong, Scott, that we might see this outside of Microsoft, even though Microsoft has a special situation that some of the others won't. And I, I could see Ubisoft uh, being a company that, that would be a, a little more amenable to this than even Microsoft would be if it weren't for that agreement. Yep. All right, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes from MacAddict89 uh, on Patreon. MacAddict says, thought this would be interesting to share regarding pet tech. My cat got diagnosed with diabetes. To tune the insulin dosage, which is the same insulin used by humans, we put a glucose monitor that is used by humans as well from Freestyle Libra. It worked well until she eventually loosened it enough to not work. We did this twice, and we're at a good level of insulin daily, thanks to the data that the Freestyle gave my vet and also me. Oh, that's so interesting. That's not to even a up. great, great uh, conversation we had about pet tech yesterday on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not even a uh, that's not even a a pet tech, right? That's just using human tech on the pet. It's tech. <laughs> yeah, which we didn't talk about uh, yesterday as much, but uh, I feel like that's that's something we might see more often. I'm not saying we're going to put an aura ring, you know, on my dog's <laughs> paw or something, but. There might be. This is interesting. This is fascinating that you could use but this kind of. But you're not not. Yeah, he's not not saying it. <laughs> I think I think seven the dog's paw is already way too big for an Ura ring. Mm. And he's, you need he's a only whoop. three and a half months. Cause that, yeah, because that could go around the ankle, maybe. Yeah, yeah, something like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, I'm gonna do that for Ralphie the cat. Just like how much exercise are you really getting? Let's find out. A Fitbit. You seem like though. you sleep a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, could, you could get a Fitbit around his, uh, go for yeah, that. Something yeah. like that, yeah. He's not getting an Apple Watch, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> no, he'll just, it, he'll just chew it. Yeah. If you have feedback, send it our way, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We love getting your emails and your Patreon messages as well. Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us. Let folks know what's up in what? your bag of tricks lately. I'll, t I'll tell you what. I got a bag, and it's full of tricks. Actually, I've just got a survey I'd like people to take. If you have listened to Frog Pants shows before, or you're even just curious about what these questions might be, I have an anonymous, completely simple, very short uh, survey to take that'll just help me uh, shape some things to come. So if you are one of those people, go check it out. Frogpants.com slash survey. And uh, while you're there, check out everything else. The shows, the art, the everything else. That's frogpants.com. 
Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, it's a little too late to get a union at Humble Games because apparently they've laid off 36 employees and will use a consulting firm to finish delivering their games. But that counts as restructuring, right? Mm. We'll talk about that. Mm. Just a reminder, we do the show live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That is 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tell a friend. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>